Hello everyone and welcome to the third webinar for Computer Network Fundamentals, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University, or CSU. My name is Guy Coward and I'll be your MC. Matt Constable is your mentor. Before we begin, a few words, a few words on, on Zoom's webinar functions are necessary for new arrivals. Uh, we encourage the asking of questions during the webinar and use of the chat room. We ask that you direct all course content related questions to the Q&A section and that you send all administration type questions to the support team in chat. Actually, that's just me tonight. You can chat with panelists only or to all of your fellow students at the same time. Uh, and you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you have opened the chat log. There are usually some very experienced industry based attendees who will be most helpful with any queries you have. So I recommend uh, making sure you send your chat to everyone. We'll have uh, Q&A sessions periodically, uh, and if there's a particularly relevant question, I'll interrupt Matt. As I alluded to, no Chantel tonight, so I'll look after the chat. Um, and finally, you'll find the other materials needed for this course, readings, discussions, forums, and quizzes at learn.itmasters.edu.au. Um, I actually know finally. <laughs> Finally, uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you, I'll have a bit of a talk about CSU uh, at the end of Matt's webinar and try and give you an idea of what studying with, with CSU is, and IT Masters is all about. So if you have any questions about that, maybe keep them in or keep your, keep your powder dry and I'll answer those then. Anyway, here's Matt Constable. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you guys, Eva, for your introduction. So uh, welcome back everyone for our uh, third in this series of four for this short course. So this evening, we're going to be looking at uh, some network operation type fundamentals. Um, so these uh, particular overview points are related to the Network Plus industry-based course and through our materials you will uh, gain some uh, experience and some knowledge of these particular points which are relevant for the uh, Network Plus certification exam should you wish to take that at some stage in the future. Okay, so let's press on. We're going to talk about integrity and an availability for a start to set the scene for what is to come in the following slides. So integrity is basically the soundness or the robustness of a network's programs, data, services, devices and connections. So it's all about making sure that uh, the services or the um, information or the devices or the connections are exactly as they should be. So the integrity is not you know, impacted. And from a data perspective, that basically means that data is a true representation of its original self. So it hasn't been changed, hasn't been altered, hasn't been edited in any nefarious or accidental way. Availability is also really important. So that's really just making sure that our systems are available to the people who have uh, the right to access them, so are authorised to access them when they need to access them. So it's basically, in this day and age, we talk about 5.9. So 99.999% of the time, we want our systems to be up and available to our customers or our clients or our users. So uptime is a measure of that time functioning for in fully functioning capacity between our failures. Okay, so how often do we have a failure? That period of time in between failures is what's known as your uptime. And it's often ex expressed as a percent in terms of uptime. So as I said, five nines is what we commonly quote. So if we look at this, just as a brief summary slide, this is our idea of availability. So if we say our systems are 99% available, uh, they basically have 14 minutes and 23 seconds downtime per day or 87 hours downtime per year. That's quite high. Okay, so if you were to say that you had, you were going to have around about 90 hours of downtime in your systems for a year and you work for a large company with a large uh, customer base, that would not be considered acceptable at all. So what we try to aim for is better, much better than that. So, and the industry de facto standard really is 99.999% of the time. So that's out where we get our five nines for, from. So what we're talking about there is downtime of 0.4 seconds per day, 26 seconds per month, or in total five minutes, 15 seconds per year. 
quite aggressive, isn't it? Think of that in a whole year, only five minutes and 15 seconds of downtime in your particular system, whatever that is, we're talking about a network, you talk, uh, your whole network, you're talking about a server um, or a storage system or whatever it is you're talking about. Five minutes and 15 seconds in a whole year is not a lot of time. That can be taken up with one random reboot. So that, that should tell you or, or indicate to you just how difficult it is to achieve that five nines um, in today's world without spending a lot of money on disaster recovery, business continuity, redundancy, high availability, all those sorts of buzzwords that we talk about. It's, it's tough. It's tough. When you put it in into context and put it into those minutes and seconds down time per year, uh, you know, you can really get a feel for how how much of a challenge this actually is to do. I mean, and it's achieved by many different companies and many um, technical systems each year, but it comes at a huge premium and huge cost and a huge amount of man hours. So integrity and availability can be compromised by a number of things, number of categories of things, which, and these are some of the ones we sort of talk about. So you talk about security breaches, they're probably the one that's foremost in people's minds. Okay, security breaches, whether they be uh, hacking attacks, whether they be uh, digital crime, uh, accidents internally, um, things, changes not going right, uh, breaches to security policies, security procedures, or secure processes. Okay, and they happen quite commonly. Natural disasters are obviously one that can uh, create problems, particularly with availability. Uh, that's going to depend on where you are in the world, where your site is, where your, where your equipment and operations are based. Malicious intruders really is a subcategory of security breaches, but you know, different, and you'll see how we um, categorise that. Our power flaws are obviously a big one, uh, and very important to make sure that our power systems are as uh, rock solid as possible. And then lastly, of course, good old human error, um, which uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've certainly been in many uh, incident meetings post-incident. Uh, and the question comes up, how can we uh, make sure that this never occurs again, this, this particular incident ever occurs again? And you look at it and you say, well, it's human error. Um, and sometimes we'll never, we are never going to eliminate human error. So we have to try to engineer our systems that uh, to such an extent that they take into account that human error or at least can be resilient from a certain level of human error. But mistakes always happen and that's not something you're ever going to, to remove. So you've got to take that into consideration that these things exist, they are a risk. How do we best mitigate against those risks based on how much money we have to spend and how much expertise we have at hand. Um, and generally the best way is to, one of the ways, one of the initial ways to handle all this sort of stuff is to come up with a set of guidelines and policies and procedures that allow you to keep your network as highly available as possible, okay? These can be, and these can be guidelines or procedures or policies that have been industry developed, so our best practice within your particular industry, whatever that may be, or they can be self-developed. Okay, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The whole point is trying to ensure the integrity, integrity and availability of our data. I'd also add another one in there, which we talk about a lot in security circles, which is confidentiality. So the C, the I and the A. Okay? Confidentiality, integrity and availability. The confidentiality is just about making sure that information that should be secured May, is maintained that way, so that not any Tom, Dick and Harry can come along and get access to your information. So malware is a class of malicious software. And basically the idea is, is it's some sort of program or some sort of software that is designed to intrude upon, get escalate access to, or harm specific systems or other resources. So some examples of those are viruses, Trojan horses, worms, and bots, which we are fairly familiar with from our day-to-day -day computer operations. Even if you're not in a highly technical job, you would, you'll have heard of these things and understand them. Um, so viruses, as an example, replicating program, which is generally in, with the intent to infect 
additional computers. So if it starts off in one area, it'll try to replicate itself and off it goes to infect more and more computers as it goes. Generally, they're copied between systems without the user knowledge. If the users knew about it, then uh, they would uh, presumably try to stop it. And they can, net they can replicate through a number of different mechanisms, whether that's network connections, through exchange with external storage devices, through email, um, through other network-based protocols. So there's lots of different ways they can replicate. Uh, but cut a long story short, we know about malicious software, we know about viruses and trojans and worms and bots and all that sort of thing. We know how they're well known and they're, and we know how to protect against them through our um, antivirus or anti-malware programs through our intrusion protection systems, our firewalls, uh, even some things, features we can turn on with our routers and switches as well that will help um, protect against some of the ways that they replicate or some of the operations that this malicious software uh, does. And we'll also, we'll look at this in a little bit more detail next week when we talk about uh, network security. So next week is all about network security and security devices. Fault tolerance is an important thing to talk about in that it, the idea of fault tolerance is that there's capacity for any system or any enterprise to continue performing despite unexpected hardware or software malfunction. So the idea is we, we have that, it's that whole high availability idea. Okay, if we assume we're going to get faults at some stage, whether they be hardware or software. So we build that capacity inside our system to be able to take those faults on and continue to operate as normally as possible. Now, how far you can take that is going to be dictated by how much money you've got in a nutshell. It, it all comes down to cost most of the time, unfortunately. How much money you've got to spend in building resiliency and redundancy in, into your systems. So a failure is basically any deviation from the specified system performance level. Okay, so that is anything that sits outside your service level agreement, if you like. So you're guaranteed to provide a set level of service, service to your users or customers and clients. If your equipment can't deliver that, then that's considered a failure. Okay, it's also relative to the amount of time that that failure occurs or that issue occurs, okay? Um, obviously, the more time that that failure occurs across, the greater the impact, the more money it's going to cost you, the more goodwill it's going to cost you with your customers and clients, the harder it's going to be to rectify or make it up to those people that you're um, taking the systems away from or that, that are failing for. A fault, on the other hand, is slightly lesser. So it's a malfunction of one of the particular components within a system. And if those faults continue to mount up, you can result in a total system fire, in which case you then start to get into um, those areas where your service level agreements can't be met. You can't deliver to your clients or your customers or your users like you want to. And so then you start getting into trouble areas. So faults uh, on their own in isolation are not earth shattering, but they can add up to become really, really bad. So the fault tolerant system goal. So what we want to try to do is to stop those faults from progressing to full on failure. Okay, so that means detecting things early, fixing things early, being proactive, proactive systems, proactive procedures, proactive policies in order to prevent that holus bolus failure from occurring and uh, everything going to pot. In terms of environment, we're going to talk about um, considering the network device environment. So that is the physical environment itself around heat, around air conditioning, ventilation, dust extraction, moisture, all those sorts of things. Okay, they're, they're the actual environment that your technical devices live in. Um, also, with relation to power, although we talk about a little bit more about power in the next few slides. Um, so we need to protect our devices from extremes in environmentals. So whether that's humidity, heat, either one way or the other, too hot, too cold, moisture, um, electromagnetic interference, dust, other particles, rodents, all that sort of thing as well. They can include things related to break-ins, so people getting into your premises and 
disrupting that environment or stealing equipment, which is obviously going to be a big thing for a fire. And things like your natural disasters, so like your bushfires and uh, your floods, earthquakes if you're in a zone that's uh, in an area that's prone to those sort of disasters. Now they may be less common, sure, but there's still a risk that you need to consider in order uh, to set your systems up and your environment up uh, into that fault tolerant nirvana where we, you know, we, we make sure that we manage our faults so that they don't become a full on failure. So any of these particular components in the environment can be considered a fault as well. So it's not just hardware and software faults. We also look at environmental faults, human faults, security faults as well. In terms of power, power is a big one. Obviously, if we don't have power, we don't have a data center. If we don't have a data center, we don't have systems. We can't provide services to our customers, clients, and users. So in terms of power, blackout is just categorized as a complete power loss. You have a brownout, where it's just the power levels may drop for a short period of time. Things may dim. So lights may dim, which might not be a big deal, but that brownout could be a big deal for data systems. Okay, because it disrupts their power. Data systems are not necessarily like a light bulb where a light bulb will keep flickering with a small amount of power. If that happens to a some sort of server or a disk system, it can cause all sorts of issues, damage, or just simply power it off altogether. So some causes could be forces of nature. So it could be a huge storm, a tree blows down, knocks out your power. Okay, something like that. It could be to do with a utility company that provides your power going through maintenance, construction, or failure themselves. So in order to short circuit those particular risks, we need to look at alternate power sources, okay? So as we know, power flaws not tolerated by networks, okay? Even brownouts, so blackouts certainly not. Brownouts doesn't work either as well. So there are a number of um, power flaws that can actually create physical damage. So we've got surges, which is just a moment, momentary increase in voltage, which can cause damage to your system. We have noise, which is basically categorized as a fluctuation in voltage level. So voltage going up and down. So it may stay very close to what the requirement is. And you'll see in Australia, um, I can't speak for other countries, but I would assume given my limited knowledge of electrical theory, that other countries will be the same, but there are some fluctuations in the power supply within Australia, but so long as it stays within a certain percentage of that um, 240 volt that we use here in Australia, then systems can manage that, okay? The circuitry within systems can manage that. But if it gets, if there's too much of a fluctuation, it can cause errors or problems or disasters. Brownouts is just that momentary voltage decrease, which as I see can result to failure. And then we have a blackout, which is a complete power loss. So we know that that, can, that is going to cause a failure. So what can we do? We can provide uninterruptible power supplies of some description, okay? So we can provide those using a battery operated power source. So we all would have, hopefully everyone's heard of the big UPS systems that are basically just a whole heap of batteries stuck together in parallel that provides power in the event of uh, supplied power going out. Okay, these big systems, big battery systems can be directly attached to one or more devices. So you can get smaller systems which are for single, for single data servers or workstations or routers or switches and you can get big UPS systems that are uh, big banks of um, batteries that are available for data centers that will basically provide um, short-term power relief or short-term power for all devices within that data center, hopefully, if they've scaled it correctly. They also attach to the power supply. So the power supply flows through them in a way so that A, it keeps them charged um, and also so that the UPS systems can detect if and when the power either fluctuates or goes down, goes up, goes out altogether, and therefore it will then these systems will then provide that extra power as required to the data center. Uh, they prevent harm to devices and they prevent that service interruption when they are working correctly, but they'll only do it for a set period of time based on the size of 
the actual UPS. So the bigger the UPS, the you know the the longer it can potentially uh, keep devices powered. If you're talking about the same set of devices, but obviously in the data center, you might have big UPS systems, but you've got an awful lot of devices as well. So generally, what happens if we know that a power system is going to be out? So power is gone completely. There is a period of time which the UPS will run and then that gives us enough time to perform orderly, either automated or manual um, clean shutdowns of our devices and services. Okay, if, if we haven't got any other backup system and we know power is going to be out for a while. So it gives us an opportunity to protect our systems rather than have them just simply disappear off the face of the earth and result in damage. Uh, I've got to answer this I've got to mention this question here. We've got a question. Are there any commonly available protections against electromagnetic pulse weapons, EMP? Uh, that is not something I've come across in my IT career and I, I can't answer that. If anyone else can answer it, please um, let us know. Um, I don't know. I can't give you an answer to that one. Interesting question. Um, not had experience with EMP weapons, thankfully. Okay, so if... Um, our UPS, you know, we've got a UPS as well, and it's uh, you know going along, and the power is going to be out for an extended um, amount of time, and the UPS is therefore not going to be able to keep our data center up and running. The next thing we can do is we can have our generators. Okay, generally powered by diesel, some sort of gas or propane or steam steam maybe okay generally diesel in this day and age, diesel or gas in this day and age um, and the generators will once they're fired up and once they're going and often that that process is automated so once a UPS alert comes out it will often um, shortly after kick the generators in to go if it's a complete power out kick the generators into operational mode and then once they start we can switch over to generator power thing about generators is they don't provide surge protection whereas a UPS can provide some sort of surge protection and also filter power fluctuations so there's an answer to a question there so you can um, provide different UPS systems can certainly provide um, protection for power fluctuations and uh, either brownouts or surges whereas generators don't um, They will, however, provide electricity free from noise. Okay, so um, there's not that. There's not that. It will provide a constant supply of power for as long as the generator is fueled, obviously. Uh, and used generators are clearly used in in situations where we just must have high availability. So if we're running a a major data center for a, a, say a big finance. Uh, operation or we're talking about systems that run operating theaters in hospitals they just simply have to run they cannot be allowed to go down because particularly in that hospital situation lives de lives depend on it um, so it simply has to they have to be up so generators and other systems are used to do that how you choose your generator um, is going to be based on calculation of your organization's critical electrical demands so how much do they actually need Okay, um, and that's going to be based on, uh, you're going to look at all your systems running at full operational load in order to be able to say, this is the maximum we're going to need. We're going to scale our generator to feed that for X amount of time. And then we go and choose our generator based on that, our generator system, what type of fuel we're going to be using, how it's all wired up. And this will, as we said, so that's going to determine the optimal size for your generator system. And this is just that in a visual um, depiction. So we've got our power plant up the top and our high tension wires coming through our transformers, the distribution point for the building connected to our UPS, into our power management panels and to our network equipment or to our enterprise architecture. And then we have our generator also wired in. So you can see the generator is wired into the UPS. Uh, if the power goes off, the UPS will say, oh, power's gone off. Once it gets to a certain point, which you'll configure and decide, uh, your generator will kick in and start to uh, feed your UPS, which will then power your networking uh, or enterprise architecture equipment. Okay, so that's it for that first part. 
Okay, so it's not too many questions, which is good. Um, UPS, so question there, does UPS, can it manage power fluctuations? Uh, some UPS systems can, yes. Yes, and certainly in large data centres, absolutely. And Matt, there was a, a question in the chat earlier. Uh, oh, okay. I'll just find it again. There's, of course, plenty of chat. Does a scheduled shutdown count as a failure? Um, um, back to the... the um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it'll depend on... Well, it can, yes. Um, it doesn't have to. Uh, sometimes, if, you've, if you know there's going to be... So, yeah, so if your power goes out and you've got enough time to uh, schedule that shutdown and it's done gracefully, then it's not going to count as a failure. It's going to count as a success with respect to your disaster recovery type processes and procedures. Um, most of the time, you don't even want to get to that position though. So you would only get to that position if you had smaller systems which ran on uh, individual UPS or smaller UPS systems. Um, if we're talking about data centers, they're not going to have that situation. They have massive UPS systems and then backup generators as well. So they have that secondary power supply. They don't allow that graceful shutdown to occur. So if that, you know, if that's the case, it's really going to be dependent on the size of your environment and the type of UPS systems and whether you have backup generators or not. But generally you would not consider that to be a failure of your systems because you're taking it from no power to a safe shutdown state without losing any information or having any damage to your actual system. So not considered a, you might consider it a soft failure, a soft um, failure, but certainly not a, um, a hard failure. Yes. And I'll just uh, answer this one. How long can a UPS hold power? Uh, depending on how big the UPS is, depending on the size of the batteries. Um, so, so it's variable, but anything from a few minutes, to a few hours, depending on the size. I've got another one. Most data centers need their, so is this a question or a statement? Most data centers need their RCD components checked. Yes, they do. This would, could be included in outage information. Y yeah, agreed, absolutely. So your RCDs are residual current devices. So they are devices that prevent um, your circuitry or will trip over your circuitry, trip off your power in case of a, any danger to human life or anything else. Um, does this time down count towards uptime? Absolutely. Everything counts towards uptime and downtime. Are other UPS types like flywheel used commonly? Um, not sure I'd say commonly. They, they have been used in the past, probably not so much nowadays uh, in my recent experience anyway. All right, so let's move on to network design. So what is a good design? Well, a good design is and this, I love this. This is my favorite answer to design questions. Um, I'm sure anyone who's out there that has taken subjects with me uh, through IT Masters will know what I'm about to say. So what is it a good design? The answer is it depends. And the main it depends thing is what do you want to achieve? So what are you trying to deliver through your design? Okay, what are the systems you're trying to deliver to how many people are you delivering it to? What are your uptime availability? Um, requirements, how much money do you have? There's so many questions in order to answer what is a good design. So a good design is one that facilitates all of your operational requirements in a nutshell. But what that end design is, is going to be dependent on all those other questions. A good design also should be nice and simple. So keep it as simple as possible. Okay, that doesn't mean that the design will always be simple. There's got to be some complexity depending on the sorts of systems you're putting together. So say, for example, you're putting together an internet banking system or an internet finance system. The complexities around that are going to be much more complex than uh, just looking after a simple customer um, database, customer name and address database um, in a small company. Okay, so the, the design of the network and the security requirements and the power requirements and all those other environmental requirements are going to be much different depending on the size and scope that we're talking about. But the, the more simple we can keep it, the easier it is to troubleshoot, the easier it is to manage and the easier it is to scale and upgrade if we need to later on down the track. So let's have a look at a quick um, scenario for redundancy in terms of design. So 
possible solutions we have for redundancy are to supply duplicate connections. So that is, um, so th we're talking about data redundancy here. Um, so we can use different service carriers or we can use different routes where we use critical data transactions, are, allow them to flow across more than one path. So that if one path is interrupted, we've got another way to go. The advantages of doing this is of course, it reduces the network fault risk. And if we reduce the fault risk, we therefore reduce the failure risk. Because remember, faults are a subcomponent of failures. So faults build up, turn into a failure. If we can reduce those faults, then we can reduce the chance of failure. Uh, and therefore the, the possibility of lost functionality, lost profits, lost intangible assets, such as the goodwill of our customers. The disadvantages of a redundant design like the one we're going to have a look at in a second is clearly cost. Every any time you add an extra resource in to make sure that your risk of failure is reduced, you're going to add cost um, and potentially complexity to your uh, network. So if we look at this one here, we've got a couple of sites, um, LA and Houston, and then we've got these couple of satellite sites, Phoenix and Miami. You can see we have um, a bit like uh, some of the diagrams we were looking at last week. So we've got a ring, a sort of a ring, and then we've got mesh. We've, we've really got, what have we got? We've got a mesh network, haven't we? We've got Phoenix to LA, Phoenix to Houston, Phoenix to Miami. Everything connects to everything else. So we have a full on mesh network. Now, while we have great redundancy there, we have multiple paths to any one site. That's great, fantastic. It's going to increase the cost. You can't argue with that. It is going to increase the cost. For every additional link you add, you are going to add a cost. Okay, and that's just with data carriage services. That's not, this is not taking into account um, extra power redundancy, extra environmentals, uh, extra servers, clustered servers, uh, double up storage arrays, any of that sort of stuff at all. This is just talking about network links. Okay, there's that extra extra cost. Of course, we can knock out a couple of these links and say, well, we've got a ring. We can knock out these two middle links and we've still got a ring network so everyone else can communicate with everyone else. But if we have any particular site or any one link go down in that ring, then we lose access to large slabs of our network or potentially all of it if one of these sites houses all of our main equipment and our main data stores. So disadvantage, cost, advantage, we get to keep access to everything or more regularly, uh, more often we're going to be up rather than down. Okay, so critical links. In this scenario, we've got two critical links. Um, so we have capacity and scalability concerns. The solutions we have is that we can partner with service providers or we can establish secure VPN. So if we look at, um, if we actually, what's, if we actually look at this particular one here, so we've got a temporary agency, we have a service over here that we're delivering, we have an oil company that we're delivering that service to. We've got these internet links here, you can see we have critical links. Okay, so moving on, let's just look at that for a minute. So that's one part of the critical link scenario. We can take devices where we connect one LAN and WAN segment to another, if, if we've got one particular device, so we've got this sort of bus architecture here, if you like, anytime we have a fault in any of these devices, our link goes down, okay? Our network goes down, it's broken, people can't get to what they need to get to. So um, we have a VPN agreement with a, with a service provider a single T1 link supports, in this uh, scenario, five different customers. But still, if any one of these links go down, we have issues. Okay, we can't provide the services to our customers. As we saw in a previous diagram, same sort of thing. If any one of these links goes down through the internet, we're in trouble. Everything breaks down. So. The problem with the arrangements in those previous slides is that we've got lots of single points of failure. So in the last slide, we can have a T1 link failure, things don't work. Or we can have, in the first slide, we can have any of those links to the internet break down, we lose everything. In the second slide, we also have a firewall, a router, some customer premise equipment, a multiplexer or a switch. If any of those links go down, then we're in trouble, 
okay? Single points of failure, not going to work. So what are some solutions that we can put to that in terms of design? We can use redundant devices with automatic failover or we can use hot swappable devices. Um, so that means that they will, they're, they're there, they're ready to take over so they can either be active, act, what's called active active, so they're both in use at one time or they can be active standby where one's in a standby mode, a backup mode, when a primary device goes down the other one backs up. We'll see how that works in the next diagram. We can also use cold spares, so that is we have redundant devices on hand, configured, ready to go, but they're not actually turned on or cabled. So if there is an issue, we take out the folded device, we put a new one in, and away we go, we're right again. So if we look at that configuration, particularly of the second one again, and this, this holds true also for that multi-point document, the, the first diagram we looked at. Second diagram is just a breakdown of that. So in this case, we basically have two customer premise devices, we have two switches, we have two firewalls, we have two links to the internet. So if one side goes down, the other side will maintain that activity. Now, as I said, we could potentially have, no, not my pen, wrong, wrong tool, sorry guys. We can potentially have both sides in what's called active mode. So at any one time, customers or clients this way, to the left can get access to the internet using either set of hardware, using either link, doesn't matter. Active, active. With an active standby configuration, they will use say the top link, top side all the time. And then if anything goes wrong in that chain there, it will flick over to this side here. Okay, so that's an active standby. You've got one that's working and one that's ready to work uh, if it needs to. So reasonably simple solution, a reasonably simple problem, reasonably simple solution, but you can see how we've doubled the infrastructure for a reasonably simple scenario. So as a scenario gets more complex, the more complex the solution is going to be, the more infrastructure, the more links you're going to have, the, the higher the complexity, it's going to get quite difficult to manage pretty quickly. Now, before I go to the servers, I'm just going to answer this question from Andronicus. If we use dual link routes from say point A to point B, what is better active active or active standby? Again, it depends. Depends on the level of service that you want to provide your customers um, and whether your routing behind the scenes can uh, cope with having two active links. In an ideal world, I guess active active is better. Um, well, there's some arguments for that. Active, active is probably better from a user point of view. From a uh, networker's point of view, there might be a problem around detecting that one of your active links has gone down if you're in an active, active mode. If you're in active standby, it's pretty clear pretty quickly that something's gone wrong. Um, so maybe from that point of view, but it's, again, it's going to depend on what you're trying to provide. Uh, is same, okay, so Shay's asked, is same hardware on each link preferred or different hardware brands, configurations, etc.? Uh, generally, you would like to, if you want to keep up uh, downtime to an absolute minimum, probably best to keep with the same hardware and configuration. There are circumstances certainly where you would not. Um, you would want to have a completely different uh, brand of hardware and configuration and operating systems and that's you know super super redundancy um, because then you know say for instance if there is a zero day attack against a certain hardware vendor and you only have that hardware vendor then hardware vendor then it doesn't matter whether you've got active active or what sort of redundancy you've got you may potentially be out of action but if you've got multiple hardware brands then you might be able to get out of it and keep operating so that's just one example um, or one scenario where um, you might want to have different hardware brands a good question though um, there's some other questions there. Okay, I'll just look at the ones to do with what I was just talking about. Um, does Active Active Link provide load balancing? It can. Um, again, depends on the routing protocol, the way you configure it, but it can, absolutely. Uh, how is active passive redundancy different from duplication? Well, duplication is having two copies of the same thing. Active passive redundancy is having, so what we're talking about here is networking. So duplication, um, 
you're probably talking more about data duplication, whereas in a network capacity, we talk about just being active and passive. So we've got one link on and one link ready to come on if need be. They're still duplicate links if you want to think of them that way. So if you're just talking about uh, networking, then you could say, yes, your duplication is fine. Generally, most people think of duplication as being always on at the same time. But yeah, no, it's, it's splitting hairs, splitting hairs. Uh, except for cold swap, is there a way to protect against a switch flyer in a WAN? Uh, the first switch computer is connected before connecting to the rest of the network. Uh, there are. Uh, that's going to be determined by your, uh, largely by your service provider. Uh, if your customer premise equipment is um, faulty, so it dies, then um, yeah, you can have you can have a hot you can have a hot or warm failover. So that's again, that's active, active or active standby. So certainly you can have that. So you don't have to physically swap something. There'll be something in situ, another device that's in there in situ and it will take over in case of a failure. So warm or uh, hot as well, which I think we might talk about shortly. All right, I just might just leave um, some of those questions for now because they're starting to mount up and um, I'm just mindful of the time. Okay, so servers, uh, critical servers, uh, contain redundant components, can provide fault tolerance and load balancing. So again, similar to what we've been talking about in terms of our network, it's just um, applying it to servers rather than networking equipment. So server mirroring really is about, is a fault tolerance technique where you take one device and the components within that are duplicated on another device. So it's just two servers that basically, as it says, as it implies, they are a mirror image of each other, a mirror content. And generally you're going to use identical hardware and software in that situation so that all you're really replicating across is any data or information that is um, needs to be shared to your users or clients. You'd have high speed links between those servers to facilitate that data replication. Um, if it's low speed, not much good because if you get a fault, you know, you might miss out on some data. You're going to have synchronization software that will speed up that process and manage that process. Um, and it's basically, as I said, it's a form of replication. So that is dynamically copying data from one server to another and having it available on that second server in the case of a, uh, the primary server failing. So silver mirroring is one particular way that you can do that. Is it the only way? No, but it's one way you can do it. In terms of star storage, so data storage, we can run into issues of availability and fault tolerance. Okay, so integrity of your data can be um, brought into question, availability, uh, and potentially the confidentiality as well. And there's a number of different methods available to ensure that the shared data and applications are not lost, um, or if power goes off and they're lost for a small period of time, at least they're retrievable. One of the common ways you do that is through RAID. So redundant array of independent or inexpensive disks as it's known. So it's basically just a grouping of disks that keep uh, multiple copies, either there's a whole heap of different RAID variants, which is sort of out of the scope of this computer fundamentals course. But um, there's a, a lot of different ways, a lot of different algorithms for copying, either spreading your information across a number of disks so that if you lose one disk, you know, the, the rest of the data is still across the other disks and that a little bit of information that's been lost can be rebuilt through parity and checksums and hashes. Uh, or there can be a case where you basically have um, one disk that is completely duplicated onto another disk. So you can keep duplicates or you can spread it across multiple disks in order to spread your risk, if you like, of uh, information being lost if there is a um, if there's a particular error, um, and this is just a, a quick diagram which which shows some workstations connected to a number of different file servers and the network attack storage. So the file servers are presumably um, individuals, and you've got your network attack storage. If we look at this next one here, we can say we've now consolidated that storage using a fiber, so using fiber channel technology, so literally fibers into a fiber channel switch. And we have this, now we have this consolidated storage area. So not only can that storage area be added to, um, to build it up, 
uh, it can also, it, it, because we've got it spread across multiple disks or multiple locations or multiple arrays of storage capacity, uh, then we have a much higher chance of keeping the availability of our network up rather than have it disappear uh, in the case of a single disk failure or a single server failure. So in this case, all the disks or all the storage attached across these servers is actually remote to those servers. So there's nothing internally to those servers that are in a remote storage location. If one of these servers dies, well, that's okay. Our Windows system in this example will just reroute through one of the other servers. Okay, so the servers are load balanced or highly available if you like, and then the storage systems are also highly available and it's consolidated. So just one particular way you can do it. Not the only way, one particular way, but you can see it adds that level of complexity and certainly cost. Uh, so data backups, uh, these are pretty much no brainers in, in and have been for as long as they've existed. So. I think most of us will, most of you will understand what a backup is. Okay, so it's just taking a copy of your data and putting it onto an external storage or an externally located storage device, whether that's tape or CD or other disk, doesn't matter what it is. And then it's archived or sent off site, stored somewhere else for protection so that if something does go wrong, it can be brought back on the site and then restored or um, replaced into circulation. Um, without a backup, even with high availability and redundancy, you still risk losing everything. So think of these things as, as working together. Okay, so we don't have one or the other. We don't have high availability or backup redundancy and no data backup. Okay, you, they work hand in hand together. So you put all these tools together to provide you with the best possible scenario for your particular enterprise. Obviously, this is going to be driven by how much money you have. So small enterprises, small companies might say, well, you know what, we'll just have a backup. That's the cheapest way to go. We'll just have a backup. And if something goes wrong, we'll restore from that backup. So it might take a bit of time. We're down for a little bit, but you know what? That's the best case scenario for us in terms of cost and how we want to manage things. Whereas a really big enterprise or a really big um, institution or government um, department would say, well, we need to have high availability, we need to have lots of servers that spread the load across lots of storage space. We'll still back it up. So if the, the worst thing possible happens, we can still restore it, but we're going to maintain that model of redundancy so that we can keep operating uh, for as long as, as possible and in as many circumstances as possible. Um, as with most areas that we've been talking about tonight, there are many different options available, both from a hardware and software perspective, and also with respect to media types as well. So you can back up to optical systems, you can back up to did, um, magnetic systems, you can back up to tape, you can back up to disc, you know, lots of different options that you can use. And you can also control them using network operating system utilities. So system utilities that come with Windows or that come with um, Linux or Netware, if you're using Netware as another example, or they can be managed through third party software and third party independent backup systems as well from a hardware that, that you know, all backup systems, hardware and software all in one particular system, which has got nothing to do with your server systems at all. Um, and it's those common things used in large mainframe operating environments where you have, you'll actually have big cabinets which will just be full of tapes or full of discs or full of CDs and they're completely managed on their own. Um, the approach to selecting backup media and methods, uh, you really just have to ask that question, what are you trying to back up? What are you trying to achieve with it? What level of backup are you trying to achieve? How much money have you got? That's what it's going to come down to at the end of the day. So you can use your optical media. Um, so CDs, DVDs, tapes, whatever that is. Um, you can record to CD or DV drives. You can use software utilities. You can use Blu-ray, another optical storage format if you like. So th there's lots of different, well, there's not actually, I'd argue, there's not a lot of different options, but there are different options that range from tape, um, other magnetic media or, or optical medias as well. And this again is in conjunction with those large centralized storage arrays as well. 
There are some disadvantages with, particularly with using optical storage, generally it'll take longer to write than other media. So it takes longer to write than the tapes or the discs and requires a little bit more human intervention, potentially depending on the size of the system that you're using. Uh, tape back apps, uh, so just copying data to magnetic tape is you know, the, the way that's been, uh, it's been uh, in operation, been done for many, many years now. Um, and there's, you know, as well as having the ability, as well as actually having the backup system itself, you also need the, the associated peripherals and software to connect into your network devices in order to make that backup happen. Uh, some, some backup systems are network capable, others are just plugged in directly into server hardware and backup directly off that. Uh, you can use external disk drives as well as a backup media. Uh, not necessarily the best way to go in just in my opinion, although some of you um, may uh, differ from that and that's fine. Um, it's nice and easy. It's generally quite cheap. Um, and of course those discs just appear as any other drive on your system. So it's nice and easy as well. Um, but if you need really fast or really large amounts of storage, uh, then maybe, um, Maybe it might be the way to go perhaps, but you know, for more complex systems, generally your tape or long-term systems, your tape and your optical uh, solutions are going to be a better way to go. Uh, so network backup, so that's basically just having some sort of storage system attached to a network. So whether that's a tape backup system or a separate storage array, so a separate array of disks somewhere, it's just, network storage that then your backup software will copy your information to. Now, generally you would have that at a separate site. So not in the same site. If you have it in the same site and that whole site goes to pot, then you've lost your backup as well as your main data center as well. So generally this is off site. Uh, there's a cloud backup. So using cloud services to do that, that's completely okay. But again, we run into these, um, the potential for security issues. I know it says there they implement strict security measures, but there is always that opportunity for security issues given that you are placing your data into the hands of someone else. Um, so it's important to make sure that you have a good relationship with that online provider and know a lot about them before you place your precious data in the hands. But certainly for smaller organizations, it's a nice quick and easy thing. We see things like uh, iCloud, for example, the Apple product um, that allows people to back up their own individual data. Uh, if you do, I don't use that personally. I, I just have a pathological distaste for that, um, but certainly works. Backs up photos and all that all your personal stuff into the cloud. And that's probably the big problem I have about it is um, that it, it's not managed um, by me. It's managed by someone else that I don't necessarily trust. So that's a big issue with it as well. or could be potentially with um, that cloud sort of storage. Um, the whole idea of backup strategy, devise a strategy to perform your reliable backups. That's all it about. That's all the backup strategy is. So how do we get our information from where it is to a safe storage place somewhere else? Um, yeah, okay, that's probably all I really want to say about that. So, and then we've got uh, the different options you can use for backups um, in terms of traditional backup systems. So you've got a full backup where everything's copied. You've got an incremental backup where only information that has changed since the last time a full backup was done is copied. So it's only changes. And then you've got a differential copy uh, which will only copy data that has changed since the last backup. So that's the last incremental backup, whereas uh, incremental backup will um, copy data. I'll get this out in a minute. Incremental backups will copy data changed since the last full or incremental backup. Differential backup will copy only data changed since the last backup, irrespective of what that is. Disaster. Did I say that right? I think so, yes. Disaster yeah, well recovery. Well done. Well done. It, was, it was very good. I think I got that out right. Yeah. <laughs> if it made sense to me, well, it's saying something. Oh, good. Okay. Right. All right. Good. Thank you, Guy. So then we have our uh, DR. So our disaster recovery is, you know, another leap above what we've been talking about already. So there's, there's really, there's also 
which we don't talk about too much or, or at all really tonight, but there's, as far as I can remember, but there's the business continuity part as well. So disaster recovery and business continuity often go hand in hand. So the disaster recovery, that part of it is getting your network from a failed state so you've had all these faults and you're now in a failed state. So disaster recovery is about planning on how to get your network from that failed state back to full operation again. So that's what disaster recovery is. It's a planning and the implementation of getting from total failure back to normal operation. Just as a quick note, business continuity is planning and determining how you're going to keep your business running while you're in this failure state, while you're, while you're progressing through your disaster recovery plan and getting back to full operation, how are you going to keep your business running? That's the business continuity part. And that's why these two things often go together. You'll often see it written DR slash BCP. So disaster recovery slash business continuity planning. Okay, because it allows you to keep operating while things are going really, really bad. So in big companies, that's what it's all about. You have both. In smaller companies, you might only just have that disaster recovery. So getting from failed state back to normal, um, normal operation state. And there's, you know, which is basically what we're talking about there in that first point. You need to consider all these possible extremes. So we're not talking about relatively minor outages or little faults. We're talking about big things happening. So in DRP, disaster recovery planning, we account for our worst case scenario. So what's the worst thing that can possibly happen to our system in order to make it completely inoperable? We also identify a disaster recovery team. So who that, what that is, is the group of individuals who will have the responsibility of getting us from zero back to hero again. And this is not an easy job and it's not a pleasant job. When there's a big disaster occurring and your systems are inoperable, there's a lot of stress. I'm sure a lot of you out there will have already um, experienced this. A lot of stress, a lot of pressure to get things up and running. You need to have a good team around you. So it's, it's, and you need to have stakeholders from all the different departments that are going to be involved in getting things back up and running. So you're going to have network members, you're going to have security members, you're going to have mid-range services members, you're going to have business um business management representatives, you're going to have management, you're going to have HR, you have all sorts of people involved in this team. Um, and it's really, really important that they all are able to work together and you have a documented plan together of how you're going to get from total destruction back to normal operation. It's a really stressful time, really stressful environment. You need to have a documented plan on how you're going to go through and get back to your full operation. If you don't, uh, and it just becomes, <clears throat> excuse me, just becomes one of those uh, things where you just make things up as you go along, it's not going to be very successful at all. So it's also important to provide contingency plans. So how are we going to restore and replace computer systems, power, telephony systems, paper-based files, as an example, okay? And there's, I'm sure there's others that you can think of out there, just examples of the sorts of things we have to plan for. The plan will contain various sections, which will each um, be relative to the stage that you're at within that disaster. So first of all, you've got complete outreach. Okay, what do we do now? Who do we need to notify? What things, what processes do we need to put in place immediately in order to start that um, restoration back to full service. And then as we get further along, there will be different checkpoints along the way to say, all right, how are we going? We've got to this point now, we've got power back on, for example. Now, how do we start to bring our systems back up? Which systems do we bring up first? Which systems can wait a little bit later? Okay, and then once you've got those up, okay, how do we now make sure that our end users are now getting access to our systems. What processes and tests do we go through in order to make sure that we're getting close to that operational level? Okay, so all the way along, there are different sections in your DR, 
in your DR plan that you're going to have checkpoints and milestones that you have to meet in order to make sure that you can progress further into the plan. If you get to a milestone, you haven't met it, then obviously you can't progress. You have to go back and continue to work until you get that milestone ticked off. Um, so there are some other contingencies in terms of site contingencies that we can use. So we can go through cold, warm or hot site. So, and basically this is no different to sort of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. So you can have a cold site. So this is an additional data center, if you like, if we're talking about big picture, an additional data center that has all the necessary components to rebuild your network already there but they're not necessarily configured, updated, or ready to be connected straight away. So it's just a cold site. Everything's sitting there, sort of ready to go, but there's a bit of work involved in getting it up to go. So that is obviously the slowest recovery. It takes a while to do that. We can also have a warm site where all the components, again, are, are there. So all the components necessary to rebuild your network exist. They're there, they're stored. Some of them are appropriately configured, updated, connected, or they might all be appropriately configured, updated, but they may not be connected. Okay, or they may not be powered on. So they're sitting there, ready to go, almost ready, but not quite there yet. And then we can have a hot site, which is where everything's replicated. So you have a complete duplicate of your data center sitting over somewhere else. And if your primary data center fails, this one's just gonna take over just like that, the click of, your, click of your fingers without any problems, okay? That's obviously ideal, the best case scenario, uh, but huge cost, massive cost involved in that. All right, so that's DRP and um, it's a disaster recovery. Now I've got a little bit on fundamentals of network management, but I might just go through some of these questions. Let's see. Um, some questions we've got here. So, uh, so just an opinion looking well into the future, will wireless replace cable? Um, if I had a crystal ball, I could tell you possibly, I think it'll certainly become more prevalent. Whether it ever replaces totally cable, I don't know. Um, certainly if you look at uh, the movies, that's definitely the case. So um, it'll become more prevalent, but yeah, whether it ever replaces, couldn't tell you. Could you use BGP? Now I know what that's in reference to. That's in re reference to the redundancy earlier. You could use BGP in some circumstances, but you would also uh, you would also need uh, that's as an adjunct to using um, multiple pieces of equipment as well. So having redundant equipment as well. No point using BGP if you've got single hardware points of failure. Um, multiple hardware brands makes you vulnerable to twice as many zero day attacks. Well, you could potentially look at it that way. Um, it's less likely though that you're going to get uh, two zero day attacks that are going to be targeting um, different vendors on the same day. Certainly a possibility. And you may even, you could even have a zero day attack that um, zeroes in on a particular uh, protocol that both hardware brands use anyway. Um, so yes, it, it is still a risk. Um, you're never going to outrun that risk, but it's less likely if you have if you have multiple brands. But again, you need that expertise and that money. So active active doesn't facilitate two separate connections. Yes, it can. Yes, yes, absolutely it can be two separate connections. Um, and I think that diagram, if I understand the one you're talking about, actually does have two separate connections to the internet. So you, you can you can use a single connection or you can use multiple connections. Yep. So it does facilitate separate connections. Is server mirroring different from disk mirroring? Um, it's similar. It's just taking it to a higher level. So disk mirroring is mirroring one disk onto another. Server mirroring is mirroring everything on one server onto another server with identical hardware. So it's just a step up. Disk mirroring is a subset of, or can be a subset of server mirroring. Uh, how do we set up addresses for mirrored servers, both MAC addresses and IP addresses? Uh, that's probably out of scope for what we're going to talk about, but there are a number of different ways to do that. And that will also depend on the network equipment that you are connecting to. So you basically, if you like, you can use uh, two network cards that are shared. So team them together, or um, you can also do that from a network hardware perspective as well. So have multiple connections that share addresses, both layer two and layer three. Is it, is it safe to say that questions of that sort of um, expertise level would be great for forums? 
Oh, that would be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. All right, beauty. So, so yeah, if you've got any, if you've got any questions that are outside the scope, feel free to just chuck them in the forums, and and Matt or or hopefully another student will will be able to help you out. Okay, I'll just answer a couple more here. Um, server mirror a virtual concept? Uh, no, it's more of a physical concept, um, though it can be virtualized. So it can be both, but um, traditionally it's a, a separate physical instance. Fiber channel equals fiber cable connectivity. Uh, yes, simply. So fiber channel does use fiber connections, but it's more than that. It's a whole protocol and um, technical specification. So it's not just connected using fiber cables, it's a separate standard and set of protocols above and beyond that as well. So it works above layer, just working at layer one. In terms of designing a system using Agile framework, how could user story be elicited effectively? I'm not sure I understand that question. If you can clarify, I might be able to help you out. Which backup media is more trustable? Um, wow. Uh, it's going to come down to how much money you're willing to spend on um, a backup system rather than individual media per se, um, really. Uh, they're all reasonably trustable, if you like, reasonably accurate. Um, obviously, the more money you pay, you, you get what you pay for in a nutshell. How long must disaster recovery last? Well, hopefully it doesn't last very long at all. Um, so we actually wanted, so the idea is to get from complete destruction back into full operation as quickly as you can. So hopefully disaster recovery doesn't last very long at all, but that's why you need that business continuity part of it as well. So you continue to keep your business running while you're trying to get things back to full operational. Um, so the answer to that really is, get things up and running again as quickly as possible. And how you do that is going to be vastly, hugely dependent on the type of issue you're experiencing and how serious it is. Uh, do you think hyperconvergence is a good answer for the future of DR? Now that is definitely one that I would get you to direct to the forum. Um, uh, it's a possible, future of DR, uh, whether it's a good answer or not, um, is up for debate. So I think that's an excellent one. That's certainly an excellent one to put up onto the forums. Okay, so let's move on to network management because um, I'm mindful of the time and we've still got a few slides to get through and poor old guy's got to do his talk as well. So network management, the whole point is to assess, monitor and maintain all aspects of the network operations, okay? So the scope of network management will differ depending on the size of your network and how important the services are to your customers and clients. So the criticality of the information or the services that you are uh, providing. There are several network management disciplines some of them we're going to have a look at, but not all of them, and we'll talk about those in the next few slides. But they all share the same goals. So the idea is to enhance the efficiency and performance of your network and to prevent downtime, okay? Prevent downtime and therefore um, prevent loss of data or money or intangible assets like the goodwill of your customers. Hopefully, also your network management will be able to predict or at least point you in the right direction with respect to problems before they actually occur. So what that basically means is look at the faults, so little faults that are mounting up and alert you to them and allow you to um, protect or prevent those faults from becoming a failure. Documentation is something that this is one aspect of network management or one of these disciplines and this is probably the least favorite for most people. Um, and I understand why, because it's not particularly fun to do, but it's really, really important. So we need to document, so write down, physically write down or type down all aspects of our physical topology. So how does our network hang together from a physical point of view? How do we access 
our network? What protocols do we use within our network? What devices do we have? What device configurations are applicable to those devices? What operating systems do we use? What patch level are they at? What hardware do we have running those systems? What applications do we run? What data do we have in those applications? How much redundancy do we, do we have? Do we have redundancy? Do we have high availability? Um, do we have our disaster recovery plans in place? All those sorts of things need to be documented. If they're not doc, if they're just all in your head or all in someone's head, they're not very useful. They need to be documented so that anyone can look at them. In times of crisis, your disaster recovery team can look at them and piece together what may be happening. So documentation, absolutely vital. I agree, no one likes to do it, but it's really vital. So documentation set, what do we have in there? We have our configuration management. So that is we collect, we store, and we assess configuration documentation. So that is the configuration of our devices. So in this case, because we're talking about network fundamentals, we're talking about our switches and our routers and our firewalls and our IDS and IPS and those sorts of devices. But of course, we can also, in a holistic approach, bring in servers and computers as well into that as well. So we store our configuration. So part of that could be a um, si um, single operating environment. So an SOE type environment where we've got a single uh, operating system and application set for each of our desktop machines, okay? That's part of our documentation set. We need to document all the network aspects. So things like our IP address range, our VLAN schemes, our spanning tree documentation, our routing protocol documentation, uh, our extranet partners, uh, all the different routers and switches, how they're physically and logically connected in our network, our access points. So do we come in through, do we have customers or clients or users coming in through wireless? Do they come in through wired? Are there IP telephony systems built in? All these sorts of questions need to be answered and documented in, in a diagrammatic fashion. So a nice network, clear network diagram, but also in documentation in terms of words as well. So tables of IP addresses, tables of VLANs, where they're located, how they match up to each other, all that sort of stuff, really, really important. And then from a network perspective, there's mo one of the most important or quick and easy ways quick and easy things you go to in a disaster or in a, a troubleshooting incident is your network diagrams. So that is the graphical representation of how your network fits together. So that can be physical, it can be logical, and it can also be from a cabinet point of view too. So you have cabinet diagrams which show whereabouts in your cabinet all of your devices link, which cables go to where, how everything hangs together. So it provides that snapshot of your physical and logical topology. So that shouldn't be or, it's and, physical and logical topology. Both are really, really important. And there's an exa a really simple example of a, a hugely simplified example of a network diagram. They can and do get much more complex than this, but it shows at the basic sort of level you need to go to. So we have our core devices, we have our internet out here in the cloud. We don't really worry about that too much. And um, we have our firewall connected to that. So we have a, we even designate, you know, this particular link as being, in this case, some sort of serial link. We have a router with ethernet connections. So the black lines generally by, by definition are normally ethernet connections. We have our switches. We have our wireless router with our wireless connections to it. We have our web server, our application servers, our PCs, our printers, our phones, all those sorts of things are added to your network diagram to give you a clear picture um, of how it all hangs together. This is also really important to have when you're getting new staff on, okay, so that they can look at these particular devices and look at these particular sets of documentation and build up a really quick understanding of how things are connected together. We have wiring schematics, so that is what I was talking about before. That's your, this is your physical documentation and also potentially your CAB uh, your cabinet um, documentation as well. So that's more of a physical documentation there. Okay, we we're actually talking about the physical cables that go between devices. Whereas before we're looking at logical, this is um, physical. I'll just answer this question. Uh, is there any app or software to help create proper network documentation? There is lots of 
lots of pieces of software. So really simply, you could use something like uh, Microsoft Visio to build a network document, and lots of people do that. But there are also a lot of enterprise level um, systems. So they are network monitoring systems that through using protocols like SNMP, which is simple network management protocol, they can go and interrogate the different devices on a network and actually build a network documentation set for you. So a physical and logical set for you. That's, we're talking really high end big picture there, but certainly from a smaller perspective and even in enterprises that I've worked in over the years, uh, Visio was one particular package that we would use heavily and there's there's a number of different software packages that are of similar size that allow you to put together those network documentations. And of course, remember you've also got your office suites of applications, the different office suites of applications that will help you keep your documentation together. How you put it together is really no big deal. It's just putting it together that is a big deal. So baseline measurements, um, are a particularly important part of documentation because they give you an idea of your current operating state. And therefore, if you know your current operating state, when anomalies occur, you can detect them relatively quickly and easily. If you don't know what your normal operating state is of your network, how can you possibly know if something abnormal is happening, unless it's something like a complete power outage or a cable cut or something really serious like that? But if you're just a little bit suspicious of the type of traffic or the volume of traffic across your network, you can't ever be sure unless you've got that baseline already knuckled down. So this involves recording all the different types of traffic and systems that are running on your network over a period of time to determine what normal behavior is. And without going too much, um, we can go through, no point going through each of those different steps. What we're looking at is, is basically speed, the types of protocols and the types of applications that are running on your network and any errors that may be occurring as a regular part of your daily business. And basically what we look like is, is that's a bit of a baseline of network traffic for this particular organ fictitious organization. So we're just showing bytes um, on each of the total bytes on each of the day. So we can see that, you know, there's uh, presumably these smaller ones, are Saturdays and Sundays. So Saturdays, actually Saturdays quite busy, Sundays quiet, Mondays quiet. And we can see as we go along, Sunday and Monday is a bit quiet. Each Sunday and Monday are quiet, but the rest of the week is quite noisy. And um, we can also see in this particular one here, this Monday here, so the 5th of March, a little bit, no, no, not really. No, it's probably not above baseline. So you probably, so from that you can say, all right, Sunday and Mondays for this organization are quiet, um, are quiet. The rest of the week, there's a fair bit of traffic going through. Okay, so whether that's a, a network or a system, doesn't matter. Uh, that's just a particular baseline network graph that you can look at. Okay, so just an example of the sort of thing you look at. So the information you get from that is there's a couple of days of the week that are quiet, the rest of the time's pretty normal. So if you suddenly came in one day and you looked at this graph and uh, all of a sudden you had a huge peak on a Monday or a Sunday, so right up through the 50 gig mark, you'd be a bit suspicious and think, well, that's unusual. So it may not be anything wrong, but it's, it's something to look at. It's something to investigate further. So why do we baseline? Number of reasons. It allows us to compare future and past performance. So of the most critical network and user functions, and it provides us and with, with more data for more accuracy. So understanding how our networks hang together. It also allows us to forecast network traffic patterns. So that is, we can predict or more accurately predict the user's habits, um, the effect of new systems as we place them into production or network changes or network additions. And it also allows us to track the changes in resource demand. So we know that you know, for March, for example, our systems were really, really lowly utilized, but then all of a sudden, as we start to engage more clients and we start to sell more products, our resource demand started to go up and we can see that in our graphs. And now all of a sudden we've added in some extra systems and our resource utilization has gone back down again. 
Okay, so we can see from the flow of the graph that we've got a problem, we add some, we, we approach the problem, we provide a solution to the problem, and then our baseline goes back down to normal again, or what was regular. So it allows us to forecast these problems before they arise and allows us to come up with a solution to potential problems before they actually get critical. Um, there's a number of software applications, freeware or expensive, so commercial, that allow you to gather baseline data for a number of different parameters. So it could be CPU utilization, it could be memory utilization, it could be network utilization, it could be storage space utilization. You get the idea. You can pretty much measure or baseline or graph any of those particular resource categories quite simply now um, with either some free software or customized software, commercial software, bespoke software, if you wanted to go down that path. So network management systems, um, enterprise-wide ones will accomplish fault and performance management at the same time. So allow you to identify faults before they become failures and they'll enable you to manage your performance. So in other words, build the baseline, predict when things aren't going so good and allow you to implement solutions before they become a problem. They all use a similar architecture in that they will have an underlying database repository. They'll use a protocol like an SNMP, so system simple network management protocol that will take data from all of your endpoints. So whether they're servers or routers or switches or desktops or whatever they are, it will take information from those. It will go and poll those information sources, ask them about their resource utilization. So it'll ask a server, how's your CPUs going? How's your disk space? How's your network speed? How's your memory going? And it will take that back and collate all that information and generate some nice pretty graphs and some reports for you to see how your network is actually performing. And so over a period of time, you can get that baseline, you can get indications of when things are going good and when things aren't going so good and then apply your um, solutions as you need. Uh, so the, the bits, of, the little bits of the software that do that polling are called the agents. So they're basically just a little bit of software that either exists on the end device in, in case if it's an operating system or a server uh, and it just collects that those different statistical, uh, those different performance statistics and sends it back off to the centralized database repository which the brains of the organization, if you will, that does all the analysis and generates the, um, the pretty graphs and, and documents for you. Um, there are very aspect, various aspects of the device can be managed as, as I've said. So process memory, hard disk, NIC and um, network interface cards. The management inf information base is the component that keeps all that device definition and data together. And typically we use SNMP simple network management protocol, which is part of the TCP IP suite. So standardized, there's different versions of SNMP, which are um, basically just improvements in terms of the amount of information they can grab and also in terms of security around those particular um, information poles, if you like. And that's basically the way it works in a, in a very small and clinical nutshell. So we have the network management program sitting on the network management system. It uses SNMP to communicate across the network to these agents which are sitting on these managed devices, okay? So this MIB is just a management information base. So it's basically the, um, what's the word for it? The schema for the way the information is transported backwards and forwards to the network management system. There are several ways to view and analyze the data. Generally, most network management systems at a high level um, will provide their own interface and their own analysis system in which that will work, okay? Um, but you can customize or build in front ends of your own as well. So they can be fully customized or they can be fully standardized depending on um, how much money you pay and what you're actually looking to record. The other thing you can do with your NMS is to uh, configure any faults. So faults, 
will be determined by you. You will determine what a fault is. So say for instance, you might say that if a network interface card on the server reaches 50% utilization, that's a fault. So trigger alarm, tell someone about it so they can do something about it. Well, you might not care about that, but you might say if a network card goes down completely, then you want to trigger that as a fault. Okay, and you can do that for any of those variables that we've talked about. So processor, disk, uh, memory, uh, network utilization, um, capacity, so how much, file, how much capacity a file storage system's got left, for example, anything like that. Lots of different things you can configure to trigger alarms, uh, to, to generate a fault request and then trigger alarm that you can then bring to your attention. So if you get an alarm, it doesn't necessarily mean something really bad's happened, but it might just mean that it's something that you need to investigate and have a look at and see what, see what it's about. And this here is just a really quick and dirty uh, picture which shows uh, a representation of what you might see in a network management system from a geographical perspective. So, um, and, and quite often systems like this will also allow you to say, if you're in Australia and you could see there was a yellow, so that's a caution, you would click on that and it will drill down into that specific yellow caution and give you a little bit more detail about the events happening here. If we're over here, on the west coast of the US, we see there's an error, so it's a failure, so we click on that and it'll tell us more about the failure. Okay, and then these green dots are just indicating that everything's going just fine. Okay, so that's just a, a quick example of what, of the visual representation that you might get through a network management system. Okay, so there are a uh, call for more questions at the moment. I've already answered uh, 40 and there's, a, there's three more here that we'll answer. So while I'm answering them, if you've got some questions on that last part, by all means, pop them up. Um, otherwise, I'll answer these three questions and then hand over to Guy to do his, um, to do his little uh, discussion that he's got there. Uh, so Hamilton said fibre channel is for SAN, not network, not the same as fibre for normal networks. That is correct. Um, so sorry if I confused anyone with that. That is correct. Fibre channel is uh, correctly for storage networks, not, uh, and it's not the same as fibre for data communications across fibre networks. So that, that's correct. Well, done. thank you, Hamilton, for bringing that up. Um, does a MIB management information base sit on a server or network device or both? Uh, both. So it will sit on both ends of that connection. They need to be, because it's a schema of how things hang together, so it needs to be on both ends. Otherwise, they don't match. Things won't work. Um, is this similar to how you would ingest data into a SIE? Yeah, yes. Yes, yes so it is similar. So yes, correct. So it's a similar process, a similar idea if that's what you're familiar with. And, and just to confirm for those listening to the recording, it was, is this similar how you would ingest data into a, an SIEM for analysis? Um, beauty. Um, thanks heaps, Matt. Uh, I reckon there'll maybe be a few questions. Uh, or if you do have questions, feel free to, to chuck them in whilst I'm doing my little presentation. It's just going to be on... Um, CSU and a, a cup, talk about a couple of options for you for future study if you are interested. Um, I will just grab control of the screen. All right. How's that going, Matt? You can you see the slideshow now? Can now. Beauty. All right. So just a quick chat, basically to go over for, for those of you that aren't aware um, of what your options are with with further study. If you're interested in, if you're enjoying this short this short course, and if you'd like to take your study any further. Um, generally, this presentation is done by a representative of CSU, but it, I think that's no longer the case. So I, I'll just muddle through and, and talk as best I can about the workings of CSU from my sort of silo in IT Masters. IT Masters is a, a company that Charles Sturt University engaged to deliver all of their online uh, content, including Masters of IT, uh, and there's a fair few different streams that we actually focus on. So you can see, you know, they've got campuses around 
New South Wales and Queensland particularly, and they're quite often in, in rural spaces and they're quite often very lovely campuses. Canberra, Bathurst, Wagga Wagga. There's one in Manly as well. I don't know if you've been to the map before. Did you go to them often? I have been to the Wagga campus a couple of times, um, but uh, never further afield. That's the one in the, the middle right of screen, isn't it? Ah, uh, correct. Yeah, yeah that's, that's actually the library building. Yeah, it's a beautiful looking campus. I've seen heaps of pictures of it, so yeah. Um, but of course, um, CSU IT Masters, we, we do it all online and you don't necessarily have to go to the campus. All right, so basically I'm going to talk about uh, IT Masters essentially does the, the postgraduate education, excluding the doctorates. Um, as you can see, just for those that aren't aware, we, we've got the, the qualification hierarchy in, in Australian tertiary education. You've got the undergrad, grad diploma, grad certificate, masters, and then up to doctorate or, or, or PhD, either way. Um, and, and one of the nice things that we offer is, is a graduate certificate that's nested within the masters um, for those people that maybe don't have the, the easy points of access. For example, I'll talk about how to get into the what, what sort of qualifications are necessary to get into a master's program. Um, the graduate certificate has a lower threshold, um, but you can actually, whilst studying for that complete part of the master's, once you complete your four subjects for a graduate certificate, you can then transition across to the master's. And it's actually, a, I think, a pretty sensible way to do it because once the subjects are the same, um, and once you do graduate from the, the grad cert, you're eligible for a 10% discount for the rest of the masters because you're technically an alumni. Um, so I think that's a pretty nice idea uh, if you're thinking about it. And it's a nice way just to sort of ease into it and uh, not have the, the sort of, oh, there's two or three years of this masters that I've got to take. You can just sort of um, bite it into or break it into smaller chunks. Entry requirements for uh, the master's degree, um, bachelor degree or higher. Um, and those with just industry experience, because there's, there's quite a few of you out there um, coming through the graduate certificate pathway. Uh, typically, um, a, bit, a bachelor's degree equivalent, or like a like a, a certificate three or four, I think, might be, depending on what it is, might be able to help help you get in. Um, but but three or three plus years of professional IT experience is generally enough just to get you in there, and that's. Part of the function of these short courses is to is to make sure that those people that perhaps aren't quite comfortable that they can sort of keep up with the the, the tertiary education subjects. Um, we can sort of uh, build up your build up your fundamental skills so that you're, you're set up for for actually a successful career in, in academia, not not just sort of thrown in the deep end. It says here, it talks here about eligibility. Um, check your eligibility for IT master's courses. You can make an application. But there's also eligibility for credit, uh, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Some, some stuff that Jason from CSU likes us to talk about, um, given it's online education and distance education, we're market leaders in that. You can see the stats there. It's actually a few years old, but the, the, the data there, but it still holds true. And similarly, IT postgraduate domestic students, we, we are market leaders in that, and apparently that's, that, you know, that gap is growing. So it seems that we have a, a decent reputation. Uh, I, I, I see little of it, given I'm a short course boy. The time commitment, this is probably one of the biggest uh, figure uh, big, uh, the biggest considerations when people are weighing whether or not to to undertake further study and, and understandable because most of those will be in full-time work at already um, but we're trying to to make it a bit easier for people to to get in we're, we're now running six sessions per year or six intakes really um, so we've got the trimesters as, as usual but we we've got three what we call terms at the moment um, running throughout the year uh, concurrently or, or overlapping and essentially they they are the fundamental subjects we sort of hope that people will ease into doing the study and not you know bite off more than they can chew get comfortable in 
in forming a new routine and, and, and um, yeah, just get comfortable um, sort of setting their study habits as well. Um, we recommend about 10 hours of study per week per subjects, but there's variable study loads and leaves of absence are required and you can always defer. We've got people that you can talk to about, you know, any sort of any issues that come up or any struggles that you may have and, and we can hopefully tailor a solution to make sure that, again, you're set up to, to succeed when you, when you do want to go for the qualification. Credit is something that is available and, and something that, you know, I really strongly recommend you have a look at and see whether you, you are eligible for. Uh, previous postgraduate study is, 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 is quite common, um, quite commonly transferred across your, your, your marks for that or your, your, your points for that. Uh, and industry certifications in networking, you've got all sorts of certifications, Cisco CCNAs and um, Matt, you'd know more about this than I would. There's, there's tons of, of certifications out there that, that would qualify you for, for industry credit. And, and Matt's actually run some short courses on those certifications or, or to prepare people for those certifications. So um, there's, there's plenty of scope for, for credit in those areas. Um, we don't give credit for work experience. Um, sort of you don't get points for just being very capable. Um, we need to sort of be able to quantify it and measure it really, I guess, systematically. So, so that's just a part of the system. Uh, what is on here and, and what should be on here is, is uh, credit for short courses. Um, some of you may be aware and hopefully all of you now that uh, if you complete three short courses and that is pass the exams and, and earn the certificates of achievement, that is that, that instantly qualifies you for uh, an, an elective subject credit. Um, so if you have any questions about that one, feel free to contact me later. Um, it's, credit is assessed as part of an application process or you can actually check whether you would be eligible for credit before you apply. Um, and if you'd like to do that, you can just follow that link there on the slides. I'll, I'll throw that on the, the learn.it masters course page. It's quite a simple process. Uh, one of us gets in touch with you and just has a chat about you know, your certifications and you, you just give us as much information as you can and, and we'll, we'll let you know what credit you are eligible for. Each subject is $3,250. Uh, so, yeah, if I've got works out to be roughly $35,000. Um, if you're in the short course program, I think there's no excuse for doing all 12 subjects unless you, you really love the content and you, and, you, and you want to do it and the cost isn't an issue. But if the cost is an issue, the, the short course is a, an easy way to, to, to do a little bit of extra work but, or, or maybe equivalent amount of work but, but save the money. Um, textbook costs are included in, in, the, in the subjects. They're almost exclusively ebooks now. And of course, um, there is a student services and amenities fee, um, which will be split up and probably go to your student union, who hopefully will provide you with all a bunch of assistance and some interesting community activities. Also, of course, you may be eligible for a loan through the Commonwealth Government Fee Help Program. And if you'd like any advice on that one, feel free to get in touch. I'll just give you a quick idea of um, the subjects in the in the Masters of Networking. Given it's, this is a, a network fundamental short course, you can see some of the subjects there. Um, I won't bother reading them out, but but you've got you can see that you've got your core subjects there. There's there's six of them, and they're mandatory subjects. And then you choose three elective subjects from academic subjects, which are um, uh, commonly those run by CSU. Um, and then there's subjects run by IT masters, and they're the elective industry subjects. That they're sort of that sort of the distinction we like to uh, promote is, is our ability to to find really interesting and engaging lecturers from from the industry who are based in the industry, like like Matt Constable. So you can choose three from them, uh, and choose three from them. Uh, short course credit. Um, is only available for elective industry subjects. I should note that. Um, so, so just one of these subjects down here. And I should also note that the, uh, the maximum amount of uh, credit that you, you can earn from your, your certifications and your previous um, postgraduate study and your short courses altogether is, is six subjects out of the 12 for a master's. 
or two for the four subjects for a graduate certificate. So I'm available um, whenever you like, or, or I, I, I work part time Monday, Tuesdays, but you can always send me an email or, or give us a call on those days or, or just call anytime and leave a message. Um, if you would like to have a chat, that would be wonderful. And if not, that's totally fine too. I love these short courses and hope that you're all getting something out of it and that they are their, their own reward. Um, go through a bit of Q&A, see if anyone's got any questions for me. Uh, there is, you have five there. Beauty. Uh, yep, uh, Richard and Saw uh, has a few questions. What is the meaning of four subjects? That's for the graduate certificate. There's, there's four subjects involved in that one and there's two core ones, and I believe, and, and two elective. Um, and, and essentially you can, you can do it full time, which is four subjects, uh, or you can do it two subjects a semester or, or, or even one. Um, so, so how long it lasts is, is really up to you and, and quite often just a, a life decision. Uh, and also, uh, Richard, you've asked, is this applicable for students outside? I assume that means international students, and of course international students are, are welcome uh, to apply, and, and we, we love dealing with it. It's, it's online education and, and it's fantastic. Um, you know, that you can access it wherever you are in the world. Um, the only problem would be is that, is that uh, in most cases you wouldn't be eligible for, for the fee help scheme. Um, but but if, you, if you can, I don't know, there, there are other ways and means and if you, if you have a chat with us, we can certainly try and help you out with that. Jason Nash has asked, where can I find more information on the graduate certificate? I'll post a link very shortly uh, actually, I'll, I'll put that on the, the learn.it masters page, uh, but it's, it is also available at itmasters.com edu.au, sorry, um, and we'll get you can have a look at that one. It's it's really a a very sensible way of starting. Um, even if you do plan on doing the masters, you can save ten percent, and you know, you walk away with two qualifications instead of one, unless of course you have very particular subjects in mind that you'd like to study. Okay, David has asked if if he has completed a grad cert at CSU for a different stream, uh, MBA in professional practice, will that be enough for a Masters of Cyber? It's an interesting question. As, as I said before, I'm a short course lad and, and don't know too much about the application process. Uh, it might be the case that there'd be some subject credits and it might be the case, I would, I, I would expect that that is a yes because generally um, a bachelor's degree is enough. Um, I'll have a look. Yeah. Yeah, I think Guy with that one. If um, if David's if he's got an MBA, then it's he's obviously got an undergraduate degree first. So th yeah. that would be that would be fine for acceptance into the Master of Cyber. If he's just talking about actually getting accepted into it, in terms of um, whether he'll get some. Uh, course credit or not that will depend also on, on the subjects that he's done as part of that MBA so that would be yeah, a, sure. certainly ask about it yeah yeah beauty feel free to hit me up with an email David and then the questions might be you know like uh, what are your capabilities and, and what are your your competency levels and, and how would you slide into it if it's from a completely different stream uh, how recently do you have to graduate from IT undergrad or do masters uh, there's no time limit, actually. Um, there is for certifications, uh, industry certifications. I think it's 10 years for, for the likes of your, your Cisco qualifications. Um, but if you've got a bachelor's degree, you've got a bachelor's degree. Um, so that's, that's a good thing, for, for better or worse, really. Um, you know, sometimes the information might be completely out of date, but it's just you've got to, got to draw the line somewhere. Uh, are there any more questions for Matt? If not, um, hopefully that's that's all the information you needed. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Okay, okay. Yeah, great. So if you do want to have a chat, David, um, do feel, feel free to call me. Uh, and RPL, oh, recognition prior learning. Um, yeah, same same applies. If, you, if you've got prior learning and it's, it qualifies for a master's, it will qualify for a grad cert. And yes, you can complete any all manner of short courses. All the exams are open at the moment, um, and you can you can go through them as you like.
Stephen, uh, there's, there's a question here. Do you have timeline to complete this cert exam? Uh, uh, is that about the short course or, or about the graduate certificate? And, and yeah, in any case, if it's about short courses, um, they're open-ended. You have one attempt, uh, and we'll talk more about that next week, and that goes for all short courses. You get one attempt at all of the short course exams. Yeah, feel free to get in touch. Uh, here we go, a question on the stuff we're talking about, which is nice. Uh, Hamilton has asked, Matt, is MIB on device or router for SNMP? Um, sort of already answered that one a bit earlier. Um, there was another similar question. So um, the, the, the MIB is uh, just a, uh, a abstraction that is on both uh, the end device and the server device itself. So it, it exists in both ends, it exists in both ends because it's a schema for the discussion and passing of that um, statistical information backwards and forwards. Beauty. All right. Well, I reckon we'll call it a night there, Matt. Um, what's on next week? Uh, so next week we're going to talk about network security. So I'll be talking uh, a little bit about um, uh, so router and switch security, but also firewalls, uh, intrusion prevention systems, IDS, that sort of thing as well. So um, mainly appliance-based stuff next week, but really, really interesting and very, very important. So um, yeah, if you've come this far, don't miss next week because it's probably the best one of the whole lot, in my opinion. Looking forward to it. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks everyone for sticking around. Right. Thanks, Guy. Thanks everyone. Bye.